Centre for Public Christianity. You're listening to Life and Faith. I'm Simon Smart. And I'm Natasha Moore. Before we begin today, a heads up, we'll be talking about some pretty heavy topics. Abuse, prostitution, violence that might be distressing. So if you've got kids listening especially, you might want to pause and listen later. I came across this analogy recently. It's used in India to describe certain groups of people in that society as being like clay cups. In rural villages in India, drinks are often served in a clay cup. People who are seen as impure, they're essentially outcasts, they're required to crush their cup after using it so that it can't be used again. If anyone else drank from it, they'd become polluted. The people who are expected to crush their cups like this are called Dalits. It's a name you might have heard and it actually means crushed, oppressed or dehumanised. Their low position in society means they get used and abused by others. They're physically and sexually assaulted, held captive, used for slave labour. They often don't have an education or economic opportunities or any access to healthcare. People see Dalits as worthless. They see themselves as worthless too. And they don't really have any hope for their future because once you're a Dalit, you're a Dalit for life. The caste system in India ranks people on the basis of ritual purity. It's probably the oldest social hierarchy in the world that still does that. The idea is that a deity has assigned you a fixed position in life and where you end up is traditionally determined by karma. That is, what you did in a past life dictates your position in your present life. So there are four main classes from top to bottom. That's the Brahmins, they're the ruling class. The Kshatriyas, they're the warriors. The Vaisyas, they manage the economy. And the Sudras, the slaves. The top three classes have all the rights, but the fourth does not. And then there are the Dalits, who aren't even in this fourth class. They're below it. So not only do they not have rights, they're not even included as part of society. They're treated as less than human. In 1989, the Indian parliament actually passed a law to prevent atrocities against Dalits and move towards inclusion. But in reality, not much has changed. The Dignity Freedom Network is one of the organisations in India that's working to improve the lives of Dalits. As their name suggests, they go into communities to free Dalits from all kinds of oppression and restore their dignity. And they do this a bunch of different ways. Sometimes it's using legal means, prosecuting crimes against Dalits through the courts. But for the most part, they provide shelter and education, particularly for children and women who are the most vulnerable in an already vulnerable group. I spoke with Kate, the CEO of the Australian and New Zealand chapter of the Dignity Freedom Network, at an event in Sydney. And she explained what they're up against, what daily life is like for Dalit people. It really varies. But for the most part, most Dalit people know because they've been told since they were babies that they are worthless, that they're valueless. And so day to day they'd be watching out for things like making sure they didn't walk in the wrong part of the village so they didn't get beaten up. If you're a child going to school, daily life might mean being sent out by the teacher all the time, sitting at the back, not being included in class activities. For women, they're called the Dalits of the Dalits. So that would be the untouchables of the untouchables. So they would be more discriminated against, more marginalised, more stigmatised even than the men. What kind of work do they do? It varies. A lot of them are rag pickers. So that means just scavenging through rubbish that other people have discarded, looking for anything of value that they can resell or use in some way. It could be rotten fruit and vegetables that they could actually feed to an animal so that they can actually earn a bit of money that way or selling on selling bits and pieces that they pick up. Another role could be manual scavenging, which is actually illegal, but that means uh, cleaning out human excrement and it's just a, a foul job and so many of them die from that every year. Like in the movie Lion, they could be crushing rock to build roads. They could be working in a rock quarry. There's a lot of different things. Rolling cigarettes, uh, making fireworks, making bricks, uh, just general labouring in the fields. So the Dignity Freedom Network runs these schools and shelters, bringing children and women out of this system and giving them a safe place to live and an education. And they teach them that they are a human being of great value by caring for them and showing them love. 
in one of the videos on the network's website, there's a girl talking about how she ended up at the Tarika Centre, which is a rehabilitation centre for victims of human trafficking. I was abused by my father, so I was not able to stay there. I did, so it, I had only one way to run away from the place. I came searching for my mother to Bangalore, then I found my mom here. And I was suffered all type of things that I should not have suffered in that age. Then finally I came to a decision that I should not stay there anymore and I, my life will be spoiled. This girl's understanding of herself completely changed. She can see a future for herself now, and she wants to become a doctor. She says it's because the people in the slum where she's from, well, they're suffering without a doctor. It's not something she could even have imagined before. Then we came here, I got a good piece. I felt this is my home. That much happy I was because they gave all the love, affection, whatever I experienced in my life, all the opposite things I experienced here. This is such a beautiful place. Dr. Joseph D'Souza is a bishop in India and the international president of the Dignity Freedom Network. For 25 years, he's been advocating for marginalised Indians. Here's Joseph. I got to speak with him during a flying visit to Sydney recently. It began because of a direct response to a call of uh, very significant Dalit leaders from across the nation. They Uh, came to you? Yes. And we had a meeting in New Delhi and... uh, Uh, It was in the midst of major caste upheaval in North India in the 90s, late 90s. They had announced that this time they would find their freedom one way or another. And they approached us and asked us whether we and the church uh, would be interested in being in solidarity with them uh, in their struggle for human dignity and for freedom. And we said yes. It was a no-strings-attached involvement. It was not in any way connected to the issue of proselytization. It was just a demonstration of God's unconditional love for them and entering into the area of bringing justice and righteousness to them. Though these Dalit leaders weren't themselves Christian, And even though the church in India had often failed to address caste issues, they turned to these pastors for help. They specifically asked for an education for their children that would have a Christian ethos because they wanted the slave mentality of caste to be broken. They asked us whether we would bring subsidised globalised education with a different worldview that uh, tells them, uh, you know, we're all created equal and we are all created in the image of God and bring worth to the child. And then as the years go by, build their self-worth, their confidence, their esteem. Without really knowing how they would manage it, Dr D'Souza and the other leaders agreed to their request to establish 1,000 schools. It's been a long and rocky journey since then, but they're still going, establishing more schools every year. But Joseph D'Souza's connection with the Dalits and other groups outside the caste system starts way before 2001, because while he was born into the upper ranks of the caste system, he married a woman outside of it. I didn't choose my caste, right? I was born into the caste, and I was born into upper caste uh, Catholic family and raised as such by my parents and grandparents. And uh, I went through some of the brainwashing that upper caste uh, people do. Were you aware of the situation of Dalits and other lower castes? I knew, I knew there was this group of people that we could not mix with and they were treated differently. But I was shielded, really shielded from the kind of misery and uh, all of that because I, I, we, I grew up in an urban area so it was not in my face and like most urbanized Indians uh, who do not see the caste system in their face when they are told and many of them confess uh, we just didn't know and once they come to know and they go out of the city they realize boy this is horrific this is terrible <laughs> 
So like most Indians, I was ignorant about it. You actually ended up marrying a Dalit woman. How did that happen under those circumstances? Yeah, I, um, I ended up marrying what, what is known as a scheduled tribe woman. It's outcast. We were both uh, doing Christian service in North India. And she was a trained nurse. And I was leading certain projects and we met and um, in uh, I think it was great because uh, in my experience and I think the credit goes to my mom she was a very liberated woman who did not have any of the caste prejudice so as a son I didn't develop any prejudice and when I, when I thought oh this is the person I should get married to the issue never came in my mind and those the issue was there in her mind because of her people tribals don't trust us uh, upper caste men because uh, we exploit them we fool them we tell them we'll marry and we marry and we dump them so winning their trust and going to their village, uh, assuring them that I was sincere was a huge part of the thing. Equally, within my own family, my father uh, was uh, still alive and old. He definitely has a caste mindset, so he was not happy. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting phase. I had upper caste Christian friends saying, you should not do this. So that... There began my journey of this other world India had. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. The Dignity Freedom Network runs more than 100 schools across India. And Joseph D'Souza tells me they're opening more all the time. And he still remembers one of the first girls that graduated from their school program. Our school program began uh, 16 years ago, more than 16 years ago. And I still remember her coming into uh, our school. And she grew up, studied, and um, finished. In India, you have to do class 10. She finished it. Uh, she was very intelligent, very brilliant. And uh, then she went for higher studies, which is junior university college. And we were surprised that uh, this girl had that much of uh, capacity. And uh, then she went and she said, um, I want to uh, go in for my doctorate. And so, wow. Um, and what do you want to do your doctorate? I want to do doctorate in, in pharmacology. And then I want to come and work with your Good Shepherd Health Initiative among my people. So next year she finishes her PhD, okay. and um, and I have asked her many times in front of large audiences. I take and she speaks about her past, her condition, and I ask her, okay, uh, tell me in your head, uh, do you think you are a Dalit? Do you think you know? I I have no concept of being mm -hmm. an untouchable because ever since. I, you got engaged in our lives. You have told us, uh, I can, you know, told us we are equal. You made an image of God, and I can stand up in front of any upper caste person and compete and stand for myself and work. In recent years, the organization has focused its efforts on Jogani girls. There's this practice specific to a large region in southern India where young girls are forced by their own families and communities into ritualised prostitution. Here's Kate again, describing what the life of a Jogani girl is like. So a Jogani girl is a little girl who, she could be as young as five or six, she could be a bit older, she could be nine or ten, but her parents have identified that she should be a, do a Jogani, so that means she gets dedicated to the temple goddess. There's a ceremony that happens and she's made to feel like it's special. The whole village turns out and it's a big celebration. At first, nothing really happens to the girl and she doesn't really know what it all means. 
So usually after the ceremony, nothing really changes in her life. She gets a, a necklace tied around her neck, it's called a tali, and that tali is a symbol to everybody else that she meets, that she is a jogany. But she doesn't really understand that until she hits puberty, and that's, at that time she goes to the highest bidder for the night, and he just uses and abuses her body any way he likes. After that, anybody in the village knows that they can use her for sex any time they like. So anything from... Um, if she's working in a field, a man could just come and abuse her. If she slips off into the bushes to go to the bathroom, a man could just find her and abuse her. It can happen in her parents' home. It can happen anywhere. So what kind of hope is there for these girls once this is happening? Mm. For these girls, they don't think that there is any hope because they've been dedicated and they've, they're told that it's actually service to the goddess. And so this is their destiny. This is something that is a part of their life and there's nothing that they can do. So typically there really isn't a lot of hope to escape at all. What Joseph and the Dignity Freedom Network are trying to do is bring hope to these girls by giving them a refuge. We also have a shelter which we keep on building for the most vulnerable young girls who are likely to be sold into the system and forced into the system. And uh, last year, the first batch finished class 10. And out of the 10, three have gone in for pre-med and one is going for teaching. One of the little girls in our village, in our shelter at the moment, she was identified to be a jogany when she was about four years old. And so she was sent to spend two or three nights a week with a practicing jogany woman. And she used to have absolute nightmares and the things that she was exposed to really, really traumatised her. So at that stage she wasn't abused sexually, but certainly emotionally and psychologically and spiritually she was very, very impacted. And it was her older sister that advocated on her behalf and she saw her sister being terrorised and she actually went to her parents and through a whole different range of things we were able to connect with the family and that little girl's in our shelter now. And we had a lot of, of times of talking with her and praying with her and just seeing all the, the fear released as she discovered that she's made in the image of God and she's beautiful, she's not going to become a jogany and she has a hope in a future. I mean, I've seen so many lives so dramatically rescued and changed. I would say, you know, I just told you the story of that girl or the three ladies who are going into pre-med. If my life was all about just freeing four or five of these people, I would do it. So that uh, connection with seeing lives redeemed, transformed and changed uh, brings us tremendous amount of satisfaction. In fact, I don't know who's doing, giving more to whom. Uh, I've often said I think the Dalits have given me more than what I've given to them because entering into their life I get insights into a whole area of things which I would never have had. From the Centre for Public Christianity, you've been listening to Life and Faith with Simon Smart and Natasha Moore. If you want to find out more about the work of the Dignity Freedom Network, it's a remarkable organisation. You can go to dfn.org.au. For more conversations about life and faith, Subscribe to our podcast on publicchristianity.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Just type Life and Faith in the search box to find us. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, do hit subscribe and leave us a rating or review. It lets us know what you think and encourages other people to listen to. Next week. I, as a child, I had a, a massively hyperactive conscience. My parents never had to worry about catching me out in anything because if I did something wrong, the clock was ticking and I would confess all. Um, and that really did reflect my idea of God as well. Uh, not just that I was afraid that God was looking over my shoulder and wanted to punish me. It was more, you want to live with clear conscience. You want to be able to stand before God with as clear a conscience and as pure a soul as, as one can. And I think that idea of purity was always a very, very important one growing up. Mm-hmm.